what's a good communion when you think about rewriting your whole sermon after you hear the communion? <laughs> Most ministers around the kingdom of God today are going to be preaching about special missions. I am not. I believe what the Bible says is true. You you plant knowing that God will produce the crop. I believe we've done that here. I believe that we have the hearts in the kingdom of God here that I don't need to preach about special missions today. So what I'm going to preach about today is in honor of Veterans Day. The title of my sermon today is Being a Soldier of Christ. We have men and women in this room today who put on a uniform and said, I am willing to give my life to defend the freedoms of the people in this country. These people signed a blank check, not knowing the cost of giving us our religious freedoms. They were sent all over the world without any say in where they went. They lived their lives by a simple code of honor, courage, and commitment. Who in this room has served in the military? Stand on up. Thank you guys very, very much for your service. Let's sit back down. For all those of you that have served in the military, thank you. We can never do enough to show you our gratitude and appreciation for all you have given and sacrificed. As Christians, we signed up for the exact same things. We took an oath to free people from the slavery of sin. We pledged our lives for a greater purpose. We said that we would give up everything we have to lead people to relationship with God. We made a covenant with God. When you go in the military, after you take your ASVAB test and get ready to sign in, you sign a contract, you sign a covenant saying that your life is no longer your own. They can do with you whatever they wish. Send you wherever they wish. As Christians, we did the exact same thing. When we participated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we signed a covenant with God saying our life is no longer our own. Now, I may not be a young, handsome, dynamic preacher that that Carol went and saw. But I will preach the truth. Amen? Amen. Point number one. What it means to be a soldier of Christ. Recently I read a true story about a preacher who was standing at the door, shaking hands as the congregation departed. He grabbed one man by the hand and pulled him aside. The preacher said to him, You need to join the army of the Lord. The man replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, preacher. Preacher questioned him. He goes, Well, how come I don't see you except for Christmas and Easter? (laughs) The man whispered back, I'm in the secret service. (laughs) Turn me over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace 
that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men and women who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. When we decided to become soldiers of Christ, we did not join the Secret Service. Nor did we join the National Guard where we serve one weekend a month and one month a year. We enlisted full time. The scripture calls us to be reliable men and women of God. The word reliable, according to Webster, says consistently good in quality or performance, able to be trusted, or a person or thing with, with trustworthy qualities. Trust is a major thing to have and maintain. All of us at one point trust somebody for a short period of time. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to be trustworthy all the time. Let me ask you this. Just as the men and women in our military lay down their lives daily for the other men and women in the military, can you say you do that for your Bible talk? For your church? For the kingdom of God? Can people trust you with their spiritual salvation? Do they know that you will fight for them? day and night, to make sure they stay faithful. Are you trustworthy in that way? That's challenging. The other part of that is, Do you trust the people around you spiritually to make sure you get to heaven? There is no one man army here. We are in a spiritual battle that has casualties. And restorations. Amen? Amen. And what part of that battle are you? Are you fighting the fight? Or are you just protesting from the sidelines? There's nothing that infuriates me more than people who complain about the situation our world is in, but do nothing about it to change. All my years in high school, I went to Marine Corps ROTC, signed up, ready to go in the Corps. Ready to freely give my life for the brother or sister next to me. The advice I received back then was not to go in. Amen, I didn't go. God had other plans. God, instead of going in the Marine Corps, God sent me to Marine Corps bases all over California and every place else to preach the Word of God. Anywhere from 29 Palms to Camp Pendleton to Air Force bases, Joint Base Lewis McCord, all over. It's an amazing thing to put your trust and your life in somebody else's hands. And know that that person is going to do the exact same thing for you. Do you trust God? Do you trust that God has a plan for you? 
Do you trust that God wants only the best for you? In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, the Bible says, Love always trusts. If you don't trust the people around you in your Bible talk, in your church, to help you get to heaven, that means you don't love the people in your Bible talk or in the church. Now, don't get me wrong. As men, we make mistakes. As humans, we make mistakes. You will probably be sinned against in your time in church. I may be the one that does it. (laughs) An old friend of mine told me, it's just this, man. The kingdom of God is a perfect place. But it's filled with imperfect people. Is it your intention to be a soldier in Christ? It also requires us to become qualified to teach others. Are you trusted by your Bible talk to teach somebody how to have a biblical relationship with God? I'm not just talking about reading the first principle of studies. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you trusted to teach somebody how to have a relationship with God? That's a challenging question. We're talking about eternal life. Salvation or damnation. The spiritual battle. Heaven and hell. Are you the kind of soldier who's in the fight teaching and preaching? Or are you just one of the people at secret, who are in the secret service is showing up for church? Point number two. Never forget the cause. My definition of the cause is to help as many as possible to a biblical relationship with God through Christ. That's the cause. To help as many people as possible to have a relationship with God through Christ. From Ephesians chapter 5. Starting in verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave Himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are called to be sacrificial as Christ is sacrificial. I'm not just talking about your finances. Like David said, if God wanted, He could produce a pile of money wherever He wanted it. It says, be sacrificial as Christ is sacrificial. When we are sacrificial, it is a fragrant offering to God. You know what a fragrant offering to God is? Who here has ever smelt something that brought you back to a childhood memory? Fresh baked cookies. You remember your grandma making cookies? A certain, for me, it's always like a jolly, like a wild cherry jolly ranch or something. I always bring you back to a childhood memory. That's what a fragrant offering to God is. It reminds Him how amazing you are. 
It brings in a specific memory of how amazing you are. Are you sacrificial for the cause? Or are you waiting for somebody else to sacrifice? When you signed up to be a disciple, when you made that covenant with God, did you say, oh, this is fine for me for a few minutes, but I'm going to let everybody else do the work and I'll reap all the glory? Don't get me wrong. Everybody goes through that once in a while. Where they get damaged or they get hurt. And they just want to pull back. There's a difference between being hurt and being injured. Skip down to verse 8. It says, For you were once darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful. Then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are all called to live as children of the light. We are given a charge to find out what pleases God. Not what pleases us. We don't come to church to to find the people that are going to, hey, tell me how awesome I am. It's not why we're here. You're here to encourage everyone else around you. You're here to find out what pleases God. That is part of your mission. As a soldier of Christ. And in pleasing God, you will produce the fruit of the light, which is all goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. All goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. Are you producing the fruit of the light? It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It calls us to make the most of every opportunity. We like to throw around that scripture to people that come to church. It says that God determines the times and places set forth by men. 
You can reach out for him and find him. It's very true. But God's opportunity is not just for them, it's for you as Christians. If God determines the times and places set forth by them so they can reach out to somebody, He also determined the time and places set forth for you to be there so they can reach out to. So every person in that supermarket or at your job or at the gas station or at school or wherever else it is, if you're not sharing your faith, you're not living as a child of the light. I know I've told you this story before, but it impacts me so much. My favorite author is Leonard Ravenhill. There's a book called Why Revival Tarries. I've probably given out 200 copies over the past 20-something years. There's a story in that book where he talks about Christians not sharing their faith. The first time I read it, I had to put the book down for a week just to recover spiritually from it. In this chapter in the book, he talks about when we die and we go to heaven to be judged. There'll be a long line of people that we had the opportunity to share with, but we never did. So when we go up there, it'll be Burton. Because you did not share your faith with the Holy Ghost fire. I'm going to see hellfire. Thank you very much. And down that person goes. Rosa. All the people that you passed up. There's going to be a line saying, Rosa, because you did not share your faith with the Holy Ghost fire. I will see hellfire. And down that person goes. Each person at the supermarket, the store, wherever that may be. That just impacted me. No, that's, that's not from the Bible, but it's a story that brings out how important it is to follow the plan that God has for your life. How important the cause is that we're fighting for. As Christians, we are the only light that the people living in darkness have. We're the only light. When Satan looks at this island, he sees a small light in Kona. She's a, a small light in Hilo. Small light in Mountain View in Paradise Park. The rest of the island's darkness. You know how you hide? You stay away from the light. Satan wants to keep people in the darkness. He avoids the light. So it comes in the light can be seen and changed. My prayer is that when God looks down from heaven, this whole island will be like a beacon of light. But right now, we have over 200,000 people on this island. And almost all of them are in darkness. Therefore, it's easier for Satan to keep them there. Are you finding out what pleases God? Are you taking the opportunities that God puts in front of you to please Him? When we don't take the opportunities that God puts in front of us, we say, you know what? Your plan isn't good enough. And the opportunities may not always seem fun. 
maybe scary at times. But I guarantee you, your friend who's not a Christian, your parents, if they're not Christians, your neighbors who aren't Christians, they're wanting what you have. They're wanting all goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. Point number three. Semper Fidelis. Semper Fi. S E M P E R F I. Short for Semper Fidelis. It's a Marine Corps motto. Always faithful. Always faithful. Over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Starting in verse 12. It says, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength, that He considered me faithful, appointing me to His service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our God was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul speaking. Paul was the man who hunted down and killed disciples. He held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen to death. He actively persecuted the church and its members. You would think with all that, God would have punished him as his sins deserved. I love this scripture because it doesn't just describe Paul. It describes me. I was talking to people this morning about they just went through the discipleship study. What it means to biblically be a Christian. What it means to be a disciple. And I was telling them about my discipleship study that I went through. A man named Pete Loheed was there. Tyrone Cooley was there. Mike Ross was there. They went through the discipleship study with me. Show me what it meant to be a a biblical Christian. The end of the study. Said, Are you a disciple? I said, No. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. (laughs) Let's go back over the scriptures a couple more times, they said. Went through the scriptures. Are you a disciple? No. Are you a Christian? I leaped over the table and grabbed Pete Lohid by the throat and tried to choke him to death. (laughs) True story. Screaming at him. How blanking dare you tell me I am not a blanking Christian? (laughs) 
the brothers are pulling me off him and I'm just trying to choke this guy to death. And I was like, how dare you tell me I'm not a Christian? I didn't tell you anything. The Scriptures told your heart what you're telling me now. And I was like, well, my heart's telling me to choke you again. (laughs) That was 20-something years ago. Through that time, let me tell you how faithful these brothers were. My studies took nine months. Nine months of studying every week. They would come to my house because they knew my wife could cook. They'd come to my house for a early morning study. My wife would make French toast and everything else. Then they would say something to get me mad, so I'd throw them out of the house after they ate breakfast to go to the next real study. (laughs) But they never gave up on me. And I never gave up on the Word of God. I grew up religious, but very worldly. I studied out Hinduism, Buddhism, I studied out Mormonism. I was even Catholic for a while. In an all Hispanic Catholic church, except for one white dude. Singing, cuando oraba, alguien me tocaba, cuando oraba. Yeah, I got it down. I'm messing around with you. I searched it everywhere. God never gave up on me. Me, I'm human. When I'm hurt, I push away. When, I'm, when I get hurt, I do this. Make my own safe space. How about you? When things aren't going your way, do you draw closer to God and His kingdom? Or do you push God's kingdom away? Being a Christian isn't easy, the Bible says. You know what it means to push God away? It's telling God that no matter how much you believe in me, it's not good enough. One of the things that's kept me faithful for this long is There was a brother who fell into sin just after I became a disciple or I was becoming a disciple. This other brother rebuked him. He says, are you telling me you can kneel down at the foot of the cross, look up to Jesus, nailed there, beaten, bloodied, back, torn to shreds, look him in the eye and say, yes, this sin is more important than what you're doing. Can you look Jesus in the eye at that moment with the sin that is keeping you from being always faithful? Going through Mahi's communion, I didn't have the perfect family growing up. Like I told you guys before, I had a mom who was an addict, died of AIDS like 10, 15 years ago. I was searching for that family also. I was searching for the family that I knew. that always told me the truth. And I'm pretty much can guarantee I'm looking at everybody in this room looking for the exact same thing. 
Are you holding up your end of the truth? I expect Rosa, being a young Christian, is she, she's going to be being rude to my wife to come talk to me. I expect Chris, being a Christian of 200 and something years, <laughs> to talk to me. She's me being rude to my wife. I expect those who are studying to be Christians, if they see me in sin, to come talk to me. To love me as Jesus loved me. To tell me the truth. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. God never gave up on you. You're here right now for a reason. If it's to become a Christian or to repent and be an active part of His kingdom. My challenge to you is this. Be that soldier of Christ. Never forget the cause. There are people crying themselves to sleep at night because they have no hope. And three, simplify. Always faithful. Be faithful to God because God is always faithful to you. Amen. Thank you guys very much.